Hello to everybody. Can somebody give me a, a short feedback if you can hear me loud and clear? Okay, this uh, leads me already to one of the participants of our today's webinar. Um, maybe you can turn off the camera too. All fine, thank you. And also thank you very much for the audience uh, to uh, putting in your location where you are joining us today, because it's very nice to see uh, how many people we can reach with this webinar and uh, where they all come from. It's really nice to, to see people from Asia, from the Nordics and uh, from the UK. I think we will start with this webinar with a very short introduction. With me today is uh, Manuela Rauch and uh, Louise Lightfoot. Uh, they are both coming from Evershed, Sutherland, uh, one from, uh, Manuela from Germany and Louise from the UK. We have uh, today, we have a webinar and it's a very intense topic. We are talking about the legal implications when it comes uh, to duty of care in general, but also when it comes uh, in relation to COVID-19. Myself, I'm Gilbert Lee from SafeChair. We are a provider of an employee security and safety platform. And we're supporting around 3,500 companies around the world with this topic. And we help them to protect and secure their employees. This means uh, every time a risk comes or an incident uh, occurs, we provide them in, with information and we, we support them in this case. But also we support them uh, with information uh, concerning COVID-19. So today's webinar gives you a little bit uh, an overview about the legal implication. What does it mean uh, when I'm uh, thinking about duty of care? How does this affect my daily work? And uh, especially now, how this affects uh, when my sales staff or my employees would like to travel? or I would like that they may travel because there are important projects out. It's a very difficult situation and I'm more than happy to have this team on board to, to helping us out and also helping the audience and, uh, provide them with some uh, information. I will start with a very short overview about safety and then I will hand over uh, to Manuela and Luisa. They will uh, give you a really intense presentation about all this uh, topics and at the end please feel free uh, to put your questions into the chat and we try to answer as much as possible but you also can get in touch with us after the webinar for sure we are one platform and we provide our customers it's uh, the company but also the traveler with uh, information communication and location and we have uh, put this everything in one platform into one single app. It started uh, 2009 with Professor Lars Liedgren and Professor Lars Liedgren was involved in the tsunami in, in Thailand and he was also uh, involved in the Mumbai terror attacks and all uh, in those, during those events he always got the call uh, from some people at home and they said do you know about this or do you know about this? And he said, no, I don't know. And this came to the idea that he said, okay, it's very important to support travelers when they are abroad, when they are away from information channel to provide them with relevant information. And uh, together with Andreas Rodman, they founded uh, SafeChair. And uh, today we have more than 3,500 companies uh, working with our platform. The company itself is located in Lund, Sweden, and this also means our servers are located in Sweden. To give you a little bit of an overview, those are the companies we are working with, and it's exciting to have a really different uh, uh, forms of companies, really big organizations, but we also have NGOs as customers, we also have uh, government organizations as our customers. But all of them have one thing together. They would like to take care about their employees. And uh, this is the moment where I'm more than happy to hand over to I think, uh, Louise. You will start. And, uh, th and I'm really excited to hear your presentation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Gilbert. Um, so actually, I will start and then hand over to Louise. Um, but I think you you introdu introduced us already. Um, so a little bit. So my name is Manuela Rauch. I'm a partner in the employment team of Evershed Sutherland in Germany, based in Munich, dealing with uh, international and national clients on all aspects of employment law. Uh, of course, over the last couple of weeks and months, it was basically or most of all topics were COVID related or somehow related to COVID. Um, just uh, two or three sentences as regards Evershed's uh, Sutherland. We're a global law firm based basically all across the globe. And where we are not based, we are covering with the best friends firms. We are a full service firm dealing with all aspects of all legal aspects. Um, but uh, as already mentioned, my uh, colleague Louise, who joins us as well today, and myself are partners in the employment team. Thanks, Manuela. Yeah, so just to introduce myself, I'm Louise Lightfoot. I'm a, a partner specializing in employment law in the UK. But like Manuela, I help not just UK-based employers, but multinational businesses who are looking either for UK labour law advice or advice really from anywhere around the globe. We can help them project manage um, that advice to make sure that they're working safely, compliantly, wherever in the world they may be. So um, in terms of the agenda for this afternoon's session, as Gilbert said, we've, we've got quite an intense session looking at a number of um, key areas of interest for you. So starting with an overview of the duty of care of the employer and how that impacts on business travel, um, the specific situation we've been dealing with during the pandemic, how that impacts on working remotely, and then finally issues around employees and um, data privacy. So what we thought we would do to make this more interesting for you is to um, illustrate some of the points that we're talking about by way of case study. So we've got um, two individuals are going to introduce you to and when we go through the presentation, we will um, give you a couple of scenarios and then explain the solutions as we go through. So we've got Fred, first of all, who is field based. Um, he has to travel both domestically and overseas as the business requires. And according to his employment contract, he is obliged to maintain an office at home at his residence. And that's his usual place of work. But a business trip to an important customer located in a COVID-19 risk area is imminent. And then moving on to Oscar. Oscar's different in that he's office based. His usual place of work, according to his contract, is the headquarters of his employer. And there's no reference in his contract to Oscar working at home. OK, so if I hand over back to you, Manuela. Yep, absolutely. And as Louis said, um, first of all, we want to give you a quick introduction to the duty of care rules uh, in both Germany and uh, the UK. What does duty of care mean? What does it include? So for Germany, this is not a main duty in the employment contract, but rather a secondary duty. So it's not written somewhere in the contract. Um, but the employer is obliged to demand work performance only in a way that sufficiently considers the interest of the employee. Um, so even if uh, business travel is in the contract, is required in the contract, they still have to consider uh, the interest of the employee. Um, but on the other hand, of course, waiting with the interest of the company and the workforce. It includes the protection of the employee, not only his life and limb, but property and personal rights. So you really have to uh, have a look what is more important in which scenario, basically. Thanks, Manuela. And in the UK, it's it's very similar. We have this concept that the employer should take reasonable care to avoid foreseeable risk of injury. And it's a it's a statutory duty and also a common law duty. So, again, it's not written down in the employment contract, but it is really key to the employment relationship. Um, and it's not about the employer guaranteeing safety. It's about taking reasonable care um, and to avoid exposing the employee to unnecessary risks to make sure that they work in a safe system um, of working. And with that in mind, um, in the UK, carrying out risk assessments will be key. And I'll be talking about that quite a lot in this presentation. There's also an obligation to consult with the employees on health and safety matters and to give them information about risks and how they are protected by the employer. OK, so looking at um, business travel, back to you, Manuela. 
Yep. So um, in Germany, when it comes to business travel, that's basically, if you're required to travel, that's basically stipulated in the employment contract. Um, and often it just says that the employee is required to undertake travel as the business requires. So it's a little bit room for interpretation left. So it doesn't say you have to travel to this in this area or to this in this country, uh, but rather as the business requires. Um, this is one, one option, basically. The other obligation of an employee to travel is if traveling or business travel is typically associated with the position of the employee. So if somebody is a salesperson and has to visit customers, it doesn't have to be set out explicitly in the contract. Um, but actually, um, given his position, he will be required to travel anyways. Um, and also one important point in Germany is the right to issue instructions, the employer's right to tell the employee what to do in the framework of the contract and the position. When and when it when it is stated in the contract or when there is an obligation to travel, we the, the employee can only provide I can only refuse to do business travel if such a right is provided for in the employment contract, a works agreement or a collective agreement. So basically setting out how, how much, how many days they have to travel, etc. If the instruction of the employer is illegal or immoral, for example, if they're asking you to drive a company car or drive somewhere with a car, if you don't have a driver's license, or if the instruction does not lie within the scope of reasonable discretion, one point Louise picked up for, for, for the UK before already. So if the interest of the employee in not going on a business travel outweighs the operational interest of the employer. Um, and we, we're picking this up later on again, um, in connection with the pandemic, because of course, this is a scenario where you're saying, even if you're obliged to travel under the employment contract, are the business interests, uh, more important than, than, um, your, yeah, basically health and safety. What happens if an employee uh, refuses unjustified to travel? Basically meaning that he is obliged and he cannot refuse it. Uh, in most cases, if it's the first, if it's the first time, a warning would be the right uh, employment related measure. But depending on the individual case, even a termination of the employment relationship may be justified. For example, if it causes serious damage for the business in, part in particular as regards um, the financial situation of a company. Thanks, Manuela. How, how does it look in the UK, Louise? So, so similar um, in that the starting point is does the employer have the right to require the employee to travel? And that might be set out expressly in the employment contract, or it might have been agreed expressly. So not written down, but agreed verbally and expressly. Or similar to, to Germany, if it's implicit from the role that the employee has been hired to do, um, or if they've been in the habit of traveling in the past, then that will become an implied term of their contract. So it doesn't have to be written down in the contract necessarily. Um, and similar to, the, to Germany as well in the UK, the issue will be, you know, is it a reasonable instruction for the employer to require the employee to travel? And then the employee does have a right to refusal. But again, this is all about reasonableness. So first of all, you'd start by looking in the contract. Have, has the employee reserved the right to refuse travel or is it implicit um, from the employment contract that it would be unreasonable for the employee to be required to travel? Or has the employer issued an unreasonable instruction? And again, um, if we think about the current situation with the pandemic, and we'll look at this in a little bit more detail in a moment, could it be argued that requiring somebody to travel to a, a risk area or to travel full stop, bearing in mind um, various countries have got lockdowns at the moment, would that be a reasonable instruction? But again, similar to Germany, if the employee um, is unjustified in refusing to travel and um, if it does have serious consequences for the employer, then disciplinary action could be appropriate. So it could be, um, depending on the seriousness of the of the implication for the employer, it could just be a warning 
or it could be so serious as to require termination of the employment. So, for example, if there was a key um, customer meeting that the employee was required to travel to, they unreasonably refuse and then there is loss of that customer contract with a cost, a financial cost to the employer that could warrant um, grounds for dismissal. Back to you, Manuela. Yep. And uh, what we now want to cover is the situation on business travel during pandemic, because of course this may be slightly, it may be seen slightly different mm -hmm. uh, from the from the general from the general rules. So, the general rules in both UK and Germany is that the employer has to balance the necessity of the business trip and the health protection of the employee, bringing us back to the to the rule of duty of care. Therefore, business travel to risk areas must be reduced to an absolute minimum. So if not absolutely necessary, you should not send an employee in a risk area at the moment. And in particular, it must be, it must be uh, looked at whether the business trip can be replaced by the use of electronic means of con communication. As most of us has, have, have learned over the last couple of weeks and months, a lot of trips may not be necessary and can be done via, via video conferences, telephone, emailing, etc. So if not necessary, then you should not ask the employer, uh, the employee to travel. This also brings us to another point as regards business travel and duty of care, because of course, at the moment, the rules in most countries are quite different or, or different as regards uh, quarantine and testing, etc. What you have to respect, what you, what you have to um, what you have to do when you're returning. And so for Germany at the moment, it means that people who have spent time in a risk area are subject to a mandatory COVID test when entering Germany. And until a negative test result is avail available, they are obliged to remain in domestic quarantine. This was a little bit different. The, the timing of the, of the quarantine was a little bit different at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, the period was 14 days back then uh, and could be completely avoided if you have a negative test result. Uh, since last week, though, the uh, period changed to 10 days and the obligation can only be lifted after five, after five days by a negative test because we have learned, obviously, that um, there's a few days until you actually can test can can test for sure or see for sure with the test if you're negative or positive there are some there are some exceptions uh from from quarantining which is transit situations employee in the passenger or goods transport sector persons who, who are uh, indispensable to the healthcare system up to 72 hours and um, diplomats, representatives of parliaments and governments up to 72 hours. Um, and when, and therefore when sending employees to risk areas, uh, when asking them for business travel, irrespective of the obligations they do have, you always should keep in mind the restrictions as well, because if you're asking somebody to travel to a, to a risk area and they then have to quarantine and cannot work from home, this may be difficult and may result uh, in the employees not working, but still having, um, but still the employer having to pay them. But we will pick this up with the case study a little bit later on again. But just that you keep this in mind when sending people around, even if they are obliged to, uh, not necessarily, it may make sense to do so. Uh, and maybe the, the trip should be postponed rather than sending them immediately. How does it look in the UK as regards the rules, Louise? So, um, in England at the moment, we are in a, a, a period of lockdown until the 2nd of December. And um, the UK government position for England is that um, no one should be traveling overseas at all at the moment. Um, work can be a limited exception, but similar to Germany, um, if, if people have traveled to a risk area overseas, then there will be um, an obligation to quarantine for 14 days when they come back. But any travel between England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland at the moment, any kind of domestic um, travel, there's no quarantine period required. But um, I think what is confusing for a lot of employers is that there are different rules between Scotland, Wales, England and Northern Ireland, some subtle differences about um, what is and isn't permitted at the moment. So in England, 
as I say, we have a period of, of lockdown and um, that lockdown doesn't extend to Scotland. Scotland has a tiering um, uh, approach. Um, Wales has just come out of a lockdown. Um, and so th there isn't consistency throughout the UK, but broadly, anyone traveling overseas um, would be subject to a 14 day quarantine unless they are exempt. And again, um, similar to, to Germany, the exemptions you know, look pretty much the same. So um, if the reason for the travel into the UK is because you're in transit, then you're exempt. If you're an employee in, say, the passenger or goods transport sector, then you would be exempt from the quarantine. Also, any specialist infrastructure, technical workers um, and diplomats, representatives of parliament and governments as well. OK, so looking at the case study. Yeah, and I think we um, starting with Fred here. Um, and if you if you uh, remember, Fred was field based. So basically traveling is one of his major obligations under his contract um, and may even be related to yeah or affect his his remuneration depending on sales etc so in germany it looks as follows if fred belongs to a risk group which means if he's um over 60 or has some health issues some other health issues um the employer cannot instruct fred to go on a business travel in a covid 19 risk area though even if he's obliged to do so under his contract the employer cannot ask for this and if he's refusing there will be no employment related consequences and the employer still have to pay him. This is because Fred's personal interests outweigh the employer's operational interests in going on business travel because he belongs to a risk group and the infection could have serious consequences. Therefore, he can refuse his work performance um, because it's unreasonable to ask him to do so. For business travel to non-risk areas, um, that's something you can ask from Fred, from a fee-based employee, if he's obliged to travel. But the employer, within the meaning of duty of care, has to provide Fred with safe means of transport, for example, a company car, rental car, etc. So you, the employer cannot force him to go on business travel by using public transportation, because this obviously increases um, the risk of an infection. If Fred does not belong to any risk group, um, even during lockdown, um, does, even during lockdown, um, he cannot he cannot refuse to go on a business travel because working obviously traveling is obviously still allowed. Um, if he's as he's bound to meet an important customer, that's a business interest. The employer the employer's business interest outweighs the. Fred's interest in not going on a business travel. Um, and because he's not a risk group, the infection is still manageable um, when precautions are met, like, for example, mask, hygiene, etc., like the general rules we all have to follow. And um, if he gets infected, and that's obviously uh, the opinion in this case is of, of uh, jurisdiction and, and the major legal opinion, this would not be more dan dangerous for him than a normal flu. So the employer could ask him to go on a business travel. If he refuses, that would have employment related consequences then. Thanks, Manuela. So, so looking at the situation in the UK, and would it be different? So um, at the moment, because England is on, well, let, let's start from the beginning, actually. The, the UK distinguishes between shielded and other vulnerable groups. So we have, um, those who are deemed to be um, extremely clinical, clinically vulnerable, and they will have received a letter from the government advising them that they should take more precautions than anybody else. Now, because in England we're in a period of lockdown, those individuals at the moment have been strongly advised not to leave the house, even to go to work. And so um, it would be unreasonable for Fred to be required to undertake a business trip in the current lockdown. Now, outside of lockdown, um, 
the government had paused the shielding protections on the 1st of August. So before this lockdown, this second lockdown period, and I'm assuming once this lockdown period ends, if it does end on the 2nd of December, then whilst Fred might be still clinically extremely vulnerable, if the lockdown measures are eased and shielding is paused again, then he would be treated the same as any other vulnerable group. And there would need to be a risk assessment as to whether or not it was reasonable for Fred to travel. But currently in England, um, he wouldn't be permitted to travel and it would be unreasonable to request him to do so. If Fred doesn't belong to any risk group, then at the moment during the lockdown period, um, travel is permitted but it must be for a legally permitted reason. And this is quite a high threshold. And whilst work is a legally permitted reason, um, it is only where working from home is not reasonably possible. So I guess from the employer's perspective, you'd have to be saying, well, it is actually necessary for you to leave the house and go and meet this client in person. But you would have to look at whether actually there is a, a, a less dangerous, if you like, option and whether um, a virtual meeting would be OK instead. So a, a risk assessment would be required. Um, and assuming that you were able to show that this was super important and that it couldn't be reasonably carried out from home, um, then it may mean that um, the travel is permitted, but the risk must be managed. Um, so with you know, making sure that Fred um, travels safely, follows good hygiene, that kind of thing. You'd also need to check um, that the activity he's traveling for is permitted in the destination country, given the various lockdown rules around the globe at the moment. Yeah, and we we, we also would like to cover the, the precautions again for unavoidable business travels, which are quite similar in both countries, Germany and, and the UK. So as said already, um, when, when sending somebody on a business trip, it may be advisable to ask them or to provide a company car or a car. And when sharing a vehicle, a minimum distance of 1.5 meters between individuals must be kept, which basically means, uh, not more than two employees can travel in one car because one is sitting in front, one in the back, maybe a third one in the back, but that's, that's, uh, that's all. I think UK is a little bit more cautious even and says two meter would be the recommended distance and uh, therefore I said per number of persons must be limited and um, mouth and nose protection masks gloves and hand sanitizer must be provided um, which is I think the same in the UK Louise if I yeah it right yes yes and Picking up again on quarantine and, and consequences as regards Fred here. So basically Fred will have to quarantine in, in Germany, uh, or even the UK, if not one of the exceptions applies. And, um, so if he, if he can work from home at this time, then he will, then, then he should do so. And as we have learned from the case study, um, his, his place of work, if he's not traveling is his home office. So basically he, he's obliged to work from home. Um, and this would be possible. But even if he's, if it's not possible to work from home for any reason, um, because he was required to travel for work, because the employer has requested him to, tr to travel for work, uh, he would still get his remuneration. The, when, when coming to the ban on business travel, um, and asking if Fred is allowed to go. So if you can ask him to stay at home, because as said before, sometimes in particular sales employees or field based employees, they may major parts of their remuneration may be related to customer visiting, customer relationships, sales, etc. So they actually do want to travel. Um, and again, um, the employer has to carry out a balancing of interest, which means do the operational interest of the employer outweigh the personal interest of the employee. Um, so also, yeah, protecting other employees, other colleagues um, from the risk when Fred is going on business travel um, versus, for example, his interest in, in remuneration. Um, so in most of the cases, the protection of all employees or the workforce may be, may be outweighed 
targeting the the interest of Fred personally, but this is a case to case uh, decision. And um, one thing to mention is because that's a question we got asked a lot: is can I ask the employees or can I force the employees to stay at home, so not privately travel to COVID risk areas? For Germany, you can't. Um, because that's a private decision. However, if somebody on purpose goes into a risk area and then cannot go come to work afterwards, he may lose his entitlement to remuneration. Um, I think in the UK is a little bit different, Louise, when it comes to uh, asking people to stay at home. Yeah, so so the general principle is the same, that we shouldn't be inquiring about somebody's personal life. And if someone has, you know, booked a holiday and they've paid for that holiday and then the rules about um, travel corridors and quarantine have changed, etc., the employer isn't entitled to tell the employee to cancel their holiday and stay at home. But what the employer can do, provided that they make this clear before the employee travels, is um, to warn the employee that if they do go, then they will have to um, quarantine at home and they will be unpaid for that period. And the UK government have really upped the stakes with this recently because it's now there's now quite a high risk for employers of, of prosecution if they do not, if they knowingly allow an employee to break quarantine and to come into work. So it's, it is really important for the employer that they're not allowing that. But equally, before they can withhold salary, they need to have made that clear to the employee before they go on the holiday that they'll come home. And if they can't work from home, they will be unpaid for that period. OK, so we're going to look now at, at working remotely and some of the issues that crop up here. Um, and in, in terms of the basic principles, they're very similar in both Germany and the UK. Employees are only entitled to work from home if it's provided for in their contract. And of course, in Germany, that includes an inner works agreement or a collective agreement. If that isn't the case, then there's there's no legal entitlement for the employee to work from home. Um, and them not turning up to work and just choosing to work from home in a non-pandemic situation um, could be a disciplinary matter and could lead to um, a, a sanction such as a warning or termination of employment. So that's the basic principle. Um, so what that means is employees are only obliged to work from home. So the flip side of this, if you like, um, we can only require them to work from home if it's provided for in the employment contract or in a works agreement or a collective agreement. And if that's not the case, we can't force employees to work from home. Um, but of course, where we are at the moment with the pandemic, so we've had a situation where governments have effectively implemented that rule for us, haven't they? So in the UK, for example, during lockdown period, employers were told that um, you know their premises had to close in some situations and employees should work from home if if they could if that was possible and so what we quickly found is that during the pandemic situation thousands and thousands of employees have started working from home without us really considering the contractual position and whether we had the right to require them to do that and now what we're starting to see are lots of businesses asking the question well can we continue with that indefinitely if we want to? What are the long term implications for the business? How do we um, make sure that we can look after the employees health and safety while they're working at home? Are there any tax implications from them working from home? And um, can we actually, if we want to, force them back into the office now, given this was just a temporary emergency measure? So a lot of issues to consider. And we're going to look now at, at the specific case study involving Oscar. So back to you, Manuela. Yeah. And Oscar was the was uh, the guy just to to um, uh, remember you who is basically who is office based. Um, and so uh, the employer can instruct Oscar to temporarily work from home, even though no contractual agreement exists in Germany. Um, if the presence of the at the workplace is not required i mean of course if we're talking about production for example you just cannot work from home um, and in germany if there's a works council the consent is required um, to ask employees to work temporarily from home in particular if it comes to a collective request to basically all employees but again the instruction must lie within the scope of reasonable 
discretion. However, during the pandemic situation, um, the major opinion uh, with courts and lawyers, etc., was that um, you can ask employees to work from home temporarily because of the risk for health and safety of the employees. One problem we, we do see, and Louise picked this up before, or um, mentioned this before, is of course, if you're asking the employee to work from home, um, you're partly disposing of the home, of Oscar's home here, because he now has to basically provide a room to work. And I guess everybody knows who, who is not generally working from home, how this looks like during the, over the last couple of weeks and months. Um, actually somewhere sitting in the living room or dining room or wherever, uh, putting up the laptop. So this is a constitutionally protected, the, the uh, place of home is constitutionally protected. So it must be justified to really ask him. And, um, therefore, in Germany, generally, you're saying if he has already worked from home in the past or if he agrees from home, um, then it's fine. But again, major opinion is that during the pandemic, you still can ask the employees temporarily to ask from home if they are not done so in the past. And even if they are not agreeing, you can request this if they do have some space to work from home. This is because of the employer's interests to maintain the business operations, not only for themselves, for financial reasons, but also, of course, um, to protect the workplace of all employees, basically. And um, But the duty of care requires the employer to protect the employees. So, therefore, saying if, if everybody can work from home, that's for hy hygienic, for hygienic measures. Um, and if we cannot keep the distance, the respective dis distance which is required, um, it's safer to work from home basically, because sometimes it's just, it's just not possible to keep the distance if you're sharing offices, for example, etc. Um, and if this is not, if, if no safe workplace is, is possible in Germany, uh, the employer, as mentioned before, can say you have to work from home or you have to take paid leave of absence. Um, because it's my obligation, it's my, it's the employer's obligation to provide a safe workplace. So if it's not possible in the office and if it's also not possible from home, then you still have to pay the employee if they cannot work. I think in the UK, Louise, you, you, have to take further measures like providing yeah. equipment yeah so in the uk we've got some um covid secure working guidelines for different industries different sectors um but the basic premise is that um you know the employer provided the employer can make the workplace covid secure then it's safe for the employee to work there and the and the employee can't insist to work from home and making the workplace covid secure would involve similar Similar things to, to what Manuela has just mentioned, such as trying to maintain the safe distance. Um, in the UK, the starting point is two meters, but if someone is wearing a mask, then it's reduced to one meter. And um, if if um, safe distance can't be maintained, can other measures be implemented, such as um, erecting protective screens or having um, a, a sort of a, a one-way system in the workplace or moving desks so that people are kept at a safe distance so all of all of those types of measures in, and, and would include as well um good hygiene measures so regular cleaning making sanitizer available etc all of those factors should be looked at in making the premises covid secure but again if we can't do that and and, I, and to be fair i haven't come i don't think across any situation where an employer has has said to me they haven't been able to make the workplace covid secure and um, but if that isn't possible and the employee can work from home, then they should. And if they can't work from home, then again, because it is the employer, the employee is ready, willing and able to work. It's just that they are prevented from working. Then they would be entitled to be paid um, unless they are eligible for the UK's furlough scheme where they could be paid at a, a lower rate of pay, 80 percent of pay. And when asking somebody to temporarily work from home, um, 
of course, the employer still has to provide the necessary uh, infrastructure. So Oscar would be entitled, for example, for to a laptop um, if he needs a printer, etc. That's that's equipment the employer then has to provide. Um, you cannot ask the employee to basically buy it themselves. So if you're asking them, um, then then you have to provide the equipment. The equipment. If we're talking about an entitlement to work remotely. As there's no respective agreement in Oscar's contract, there's basically no entitlement. Um, and this also is not, is in Germany at least, um, there's no general entitlement also during the pandemic. Um, of course, they can, they can agree this employer and Oscar can agree this at least temporarily, but, um, you, you have to be quite careful. As Louise mentioned before, referred before, there, there may be a risk that if you're tolerating somebody to work from home for a certain period of time, an respective entitlement may actually arise over um, a certain period of time. So it would be wise to actually agree the rules on this and, and what is provided, etc. And, but if no mutual agreement, um, can, can be reached, uh, this can only, Oscar can only, uh, request to work at the home office again if his personal interests outweigh the business interest, the operational interest. Some of the, some of the reasons for this could be necessary childcare. Um, as we said, social distancing cannot be maintained at the workplace. Some colleagues have been tested positive. You cannot ask somebody to come to work if positive tested coll colleagues have worked or are working in the same office space or Oscar belongs to a risk group or has an underlying illness. Um, in this scenario, he can he can actually request to work from home. But this is all, at least at a German law, this is all pretty new and um, yeah, subject to the opinion of jurisdiction, lawyers, etc. Because there's no legal entitlement, there are some attempts from the Federal Minister of Labour to introduce such a home office entitlement um, of at least 24 days for a five-day working week. Uh, however, opinion as regards this draft is pretty bad, actually. Um, and we do not expect to the, the draft to be passed by the Bundestag in this, in this, uh, um, legislative period, because it's just, it's just not yet workable, actually. Um, and even the unions have called out that this may not be very sensible to implement, implement the, the, yeah, draft as it is at the moment. Employers have been quite angry about the draft actually because they're saying we're looking for something different. We're not looking for a home office entitlement. We rather want to see some flexible working rules, which helps us containing the business as well. Don't think there's something like this in the UK, right? Louise, any, any attempts? No. Yeah. No, that's right. Okay, so we're going to move on to look at now some of the issues around um, data privacy. So um, for those who, who aren't aware, when we're looking at the GDPR and, and the protections around data privacy, we're looking at um, the protections surrounding personal data and the processing of personal data. And the definition is set out on the slide. It's, it's basically personal data is any information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. Um, and in Germany, so at the, obviously in this context of this session, we're talking about some data which is going to be very sensitive or special category data um, around health, um, possibly around political opinions, but, but mainly around health, I guess, with, is the most relevant here. And in Germany, the processing of that type of data is basically prohibited. But there are some exemptions, which Manuela will come on to in a moment. In the UK, um, uh, processing data about an employee's health is permitted, but provided that an impact assessment has been carried out and we've got a lawful basis for processing. And that might be um, because it's necessary for the performance of the employment contract, but also one of the listed um, conditions under GDPR for processing is met, such as explicit consent. 
And then we talk about um, the data controller and in, in the context of this session, the data controller will be the employer. So this is the, the natural or legal person who determines, you know, what, why are we holding this data and what are we going to do with it? And so as I say, in, in our context talking today, it would be the employer who is seen as the controller and they are the ones that will have um, the obligations to ensure that um, the principles around data privacy are maintained. Um, and when GDPR was, was implemented, there was quite a lot of publicity about some of the draconian measures that could be undertaken for any breach or violation of GDPR. And I think Germany probably um, uh, takes maybe a, a, a stronger line on this. Certainly the Information Commissioner in the UK does have the power um, to, to um, administer quite hefty fines as set out on the slide. But typically, I think fines are seen as a last resort and the ICO in the UK would be looking at other things like warnings or reprimands or rectification of data before they would be imposing some of these eye-watering sums of money. Is that the same in Germany, um, Manuela? Yeah, I think they are, they are, of course, looking at the single case and they may, they may uh, impose... Uh, milder measures or ma ma milder um, sanctions in the beginning. But unfortunately, um, in particular, if we're talking about bigger companies, they are often starting already with quite high amount of uh, of money because they want to set uh, set some examples, basically. Uh, so we have seen quite some quite some rulings over the last couple of weeks and months. Okay. So that that leads us neatly on to data privacy, GDPR, and the tracking of employees, Manuela. Yeah. Um, so when we're when we're talking about tracking of employees, that in in the context of this session again is basically when people are working from home. Are you allowed to track them? Are you allowed to follow where they're working, etc.? And basically, the processing of employee data, which is not necessary for the commencement, performance, and termination of an employment relationship, is prohibited. Um, and this means: Do I really have to follow employees, see where they work, uh, where they're working, etc.? This is um, this is not necessary under the statutes uh, to process to to process the. Um, employment relationship. There are some exceptions, permission by a legal provision, works agreements can be such an exception. And we have seen this over the last couple of weeks and months in particular, when we're talking about home office arrangements, where there is some, yeah, where, where the employee is allowed to somehow track the employees in a certain way, or if the employees individually consent. Again, if there is a works council, uh, you will you will need the respective approval of the works council in Germany if you're implementing any such systems. And when we're talking about the consent of the employee before giving consent, the employee must be informed in clear and simple language about the pur purpose of the data collection. So it needs to be clear what is done, what is collected, why you're collecting it. And the consent must be related to the specific data. So it can not be a blanket approval. It cannot be a general approval. It has to be very specific on the data and what you're doing. So if you have been granted such a general approval at the beginning of the employment relationship, this may not cover um, working from home, tracking employees from home during the pandemic now. The consent has to be given voluntarily. And um, if employees are refusing or withdrawing it, there should be no there should be no employment related measures or disadvantages for the employees. And when we're talking about voluntarily, um, this may also be critical in the consent of signing an employment contract, because the opinion here in Germany, at least, is that if you're asking employees to sign such a consent together with an employment contract, they often will sign it just that they get the employment contract and that they're getting the employment relationship. So this should be ideally separately. Um, and again, setting out specifically what you're doing. And this may not be the case. What you have signed before may not be the case now during the pandemic situation. How's the situation in, in the UK, Louise? 
Yeah, and so it's it's very similar. Um, the point you've just made about consent, um, it's the same in the UK. We always advise employers don't rely on consent in the employment contract. Instead, make sure you're giving enough information in your data privacy notice so the employee knows um, what processing will be conducted and then try and rely on one of the legitimate um, purposes under GDPR. You will require an impact assessment. So you need to look at why is it necessary to have this information um, and uh, do is there a less intrusive way of dealing with the situation um, and make sure that you're, you're balancing your requirement with the reasonable expectation of privacy that the employee um, will have. Okay, so, so finally, just to look at um, some of the basic principles under GDPR when working from home. So here we're looking at not necessarily, um, you know, you collecting data, you the employer collecting data about your employees, but your employees working from home, what they're doing with the data that they may be processing on your behalf. Um, because once somebody is processing that data outside of the confines of the of the office environment and they're doing that at home, you need to make sure that extra safeguards are in place to make sure that the data is still being held securely um, and it's protected against any unauthorized or unlawful access, that it's not going to be at risk of accidental loss or destruction. Um, and the more sensitive the data, the higher um, level of protection. So types of examples of things you should be thinking about doing with your employees is making sure that you know documents are password protected. Employees working from home um, are advised that you know printouts should be avoided. If they do print things out because they have to, then that shouldn't just be disposed of in the household waste, it should be brought to the company for destruction. Um, family members, household members, you know, flat share and um, those types of people they shouldn't have access to the work related data and you know as normal any data protection incidents must be immediately reported to the company's data protection officer just as it would be if they were working in the office so that's the end of um, Manuela and, and my presentation Gilbert if we hold hand over back to you now for any questions Thank you very much. It was really, really very helpful and I hope also for the audience and uh, you could learn a lot about uh, from this webinar because uh, you covered really every aspect uh, for the moment when it comes uh, to the to the legal situation. I have one question because what we are supporting, uh, what we come from was uh, supporting travelers, but we see more that uh, we have to cover all employees in a company or employees working in a facility or maybe uh, working in a factory. And the reason why we use this positioning is that we don't would like to overload them with uh, useless information. We only would like to provide them with an information close by them. And we have sadly seen this uh, happens in, in Paris, it happens in Nice, and it happened in Vienna too. So in this case, when somebody is working from home, we can uh, inform them because of their location. And it's not a tracking in this case, it's just we know where they are. But because of their location, we can provide them with the information that something is going on, uh, an incident is uh, close by them, please stay at home. And Thorsten is asking, exactly what does it mean tr tracking because we're, this is the, where we come from employees when they go on a business trip and the tracking is not what they are doing the tracking is uh, when they are going uh, to, to i would say to, to jakarta this is their official business trip and they have to take a car and some incident is close by and uh, we can immediately send them information when some incident occurs there because of the location and we keep the employee informed. So can you say something about this? Yes, and, and when Manuela was talking about tracking, she wasn't talking about that kind of um, data, if you like, Gilbert. What she was talking about was employees working from home and employers using spyware um, oh, on yeah. their information technology to keep a track on what um, work they are doing when they're working from home because they don't trust that their employees are actually working and not just, you know, playing solitaire on the internet. Yeah, 
uh, that's absolutely not shouldn't be no no but can you uh Thorsten, uh, i don't know if you see also the chat uh Thorsten, he was uh because uh still uh when they are on a business trip what does it mean yeah 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 so so from a from a gdpr perspective tracking employees on a business trip may still be tricky let's say it like this because the problem on a business trip is that there may be some parts in between where you're not on duty basically and whatever system you do have on your devices you it it needs to be ensured from a gdpr perspective that employees first of all that they are properly informed what what the systems what yeah. the devices can do again and they consent to this even if it's a work device um and also that they are able to basically switch it off exactly. during their time off so that really the tracking only happens during working working time um because otherwise you could basically follow them where they're going for lunch etc cetera, etc cetera. um and and this from a gdpr perspective would not be would not be allowed so two things to keep in mind first of all um consent again of the employees because that's that's personal data that can be personal data and um and second um it needs to be ensured that private time cannot be tracked yeah no that's absolutely it's it's very important that uh, the the employee first of all it's not as you said spyware it's a really it's an official solution provided by the company to support uh, the traveler or even in the in the home office and it's absolutely there is in a very prominent place in 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 opening the the application is a, a very prominent privacy button where he always can turn off all services and to keep his privacy it's, it's absolutely this is uh, crucial uh, for this solution we also have a, uh, that's a very good question from wolfgang and he says uh when an employee is traveling abroad for a holidays to a safe area and during this stay there is this area is declared as risk area i think there's a good chance for the moment that every nearly safe area turns into a risk area so what does it mean when he's coming back or what does it mean uh, uh, for his employee and employee situation so so in the uk we've had this situation happen quite a lot because the risk areas changed constantly throughout the summer and i think what we found was that um most businesses took the view that traveling overseas anywhere was a risk and that um provided you were telling your employees that traveling overseas was not really um considered to be safe by the employer and that they could be required to quarantine because the rules were changing all the time and if that happened then they might have to take unpaid quarantine at home then that was the way in which we dealt with the situation in the UK. I don't know if it's any different in Germany, Manuela. No, it was it was quite the same quite the same thing. Of course, there's no real rule on this because that is very very new to all of us. Um but but the same view was taken here in, in Germany as well if it was basically clear or highly likely that it will happen then um you're taking a risk and then you're not you're not entitled to remuneration of course. Um and that there may be employment related measures however given that so many people can work from home and that you can arrange to continue working even even if you have to stay at home um in most of the cases we find a solution but same same yeah legal view basically as in the uk uh, i have another question from natasha uh and i think natasha thank you very much for the question at all I would like to hand over this question uh, to Luis or uh, Manuela, because it's a very important question, and I think you, you need a really good answer to this. I just uh, uh, bring it up to the audience. Can you please comment on duty of care obligations of a multinational company that has operations in different countries with different laws and interpretations of duty of care? We only have one minute <laughs> left, and it's absolute. It's it's. I totally understand this question because every big organization has to deal with this topic for the moment. And uh, I, I really I forward it uh, uh, to the team, and you will get feedback. And uh, 
But thank you very much for this question. And I would like also, thank you very much to the audience. Thank you very much for uh, Manuela and Luisi to join us in today's webinar. And uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, reach us uh, over our websites. You can reach us over LinkedIn. And uh, we are looking forward to see you maybe in one of our next webinars. Have a very nice day and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gibber. Safety, the world's leading employee safety platform.